in my greatest joy, sovereign in my deepest cry, with me in the dark, with me in the dark. In your everlasting arms, all the pieces of my life, from beginning to the end, I can trust you. In your Father, we ask that you would be gracious to us in this hour. That you would see our affliction from those who hate us. O oh, you who lift us up from the gates of death, lift us up that we may recount all your praises, that in the gates before your throne we would gather and rejoice in your salvation. Father, we want to pray a prayer of blessing and of strength over the families of Pastor Ha and J.C. Park as they continue to remember and mourn the loss of their precious loved one. And Lord, we thank you for their lives, their lives that were loved deeply by your people. And Lord, we thank you for the impact that these lives have had even upon this church. 
And as the years go by, we also pray that their legacy and their discipleship would continue to have a powerful impact on the next generation. And God, we remember the violence that is still happening in the Middle East, Gaza, Israel, Ukraine, Russia, Syria, and even the plagues and the diseases that are breaking out in more severe forms throughout the world. And as we see all this pain in our world and in the news, we cry out to you, God of our salvation, to come, Maranatha, come, Lord, and come quickly to heal this broken world, to mend broken hearts, and to restore us to be the people and to be the creation that you desired from the beginning. So God, we pray for healing to happen even today. As your word goes forth, I pray that the truths would heal, mend, and set people free from years of bondage and oppression. So come, Holy Spirit, now. Comfort, teach, guide, so that all that happens at this time would bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus. And Father, I ask that you would fill me with your spirit now. Anoint me and empower me. And by your grace, use me for your glory so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing and honorable in your sights. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And it is in that precious name we pray. Amen. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names and words will never hurt me. We heard that often growing up, and we teach that to children, but in reality, we know that's actually not true. Uh, in fact, the healing of our broken bones can oftentimes happen much faster than the pains of harsh words. You know, we teach this simple phrase to children as a safeguard because we know that this world can be very cruel. We know that children can be very mean. And so we want to protect them from the pain of words and protect them from labels that people may throw at them. But labels can really scar people far deeper than sticks and stones can. You know, there are still words that haunt some of us in this room that we heard when we were younger and they have scarred us still to this day. Words like, Loser, fat, chink, pathetic. You hear it enough times and you begin to think maybe it's true. You know, I grew up uh, in a suburb of Chicago that when I was in elementary school through high school, there weren't a lot of Asians and there definitely weren't uh, a lot of Koreans. And so uh, I, I faced a lot of racism growing up. And I, it dawned on me just recently that if we raise Enoch here for many more years and he grows up in Korea, uh, he will never face the type of racism uh, that I faced when, he w when I was his age. Um, but also, uh, I realized that there's a different form of racism that I get even to this day in Korea every time I enter a taxi. You know, I, I quickly try to say the location, but right away the taxi driver usually says, you're not Korean, what are you? <laughs> because I guess my pronunciation is a little bit different sometimes. And uh, from that moment on, he will either ignore me, uh, because he thinks I'm a non-Korean, or uh, he'll keep trying to guess, what are you? Right? And then I'll tell him I'm Korean. He's like, no, you're not. Because uh, if you were Korean, you'd be able to speak it better. Uh, so I get different kinds of racism for being a Korean American in Korea. So it's been interesting. You know? uh, but you know, Michael Jackson, he also had a lot of scars uh, from words that people spoke to him when he was growing up. You may not have known some of these stories. When he was a teenager, uh, as a lot of teens do, he had a lot of pimples on his skin. And one time when a fan, a very jubilant fan, ran up to him, so excited to finally meet him, uh, she was in shock. She said the words, oh my goodness, what's wrong with your skin? 
because he had so many pimples. And that scarred him. He was so shocked at the reaction of this fan of his that it made him very self-conscious about his skin. And I'm sure that that, along with many other things that he encountered, led him on a journey of doing a lot of surgery upon his skin complexion. And we all know about the many struggles that he had with his nose, which led to a lot of nose surgeries for Michael Jackson as well. And if you never knew why he was so preoccupied with his nose, it is because his father, when he was growing up, would often make fun of his nose. And he would tell Michael, hey, big nose. And he would often tell Michael as well, like, hey, that's not, that, you didn't get that nose from me because my nose isn't that big. And so from a young age, Michael had a complex with his skin color, his skin complexion, and also the size of his nose. And we see the pain that resulted in the later years of his life. You see, how we view ourselves impacts how we live. But we want to pause for a moment today that though you may have heard a lot of words spoken towards you, a lot of labels from the world, from your parents, from friends growing up, but before we begin to accept these words that were spoken towards us, we need to pause today and look at God's word to see what does God have to say about who we really are. And we need to make sure that what we believe we really are matches with what God's word says we really are. And that is an important part of spiritual healing, restoration, and maturity. We want to remember who we are because of Christ. And that's what we will look at today. We start a new series today through the letter of 1 Peter, which will take us through most of this year, up until December. And it's a letter written by the Apostle Peter, and it was written to encourage the churches that were suffering, uh, the churches that were being persecuted for their faith, but also to encourage and guide the church as to how they are to live in spite of deep persecution and unfair treatments. And I believe that we're going to find a lot of practical words of help and encouragement and strength for our faith throughout this series because we are now entering a whole new generation of where the church is under persecution like never before, not just in the developing world, not just in parts of the world where we've always known persecution to happen like the Middle East, but I'm talking about the English-speaking Western world. We are entering into a whole new world where the church and the followers of Jesus are hated like never before. So open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we want to look at the first couple of verses. And today, we want to look at the importance of remembering who we really are in Christ, to never forget who we, we really are because of who Christ is for us. So who are you really? You can follow along with me in your outlines as well. And one of the first things that we learned today is that we must remember that we are sovereignly selected. So everyone repeat, we are sovereignly selected. All right, so in God's providence, we are selected by his sovereign hand. First Peter chapter 1, starting from verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elects, exiles, of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, if you're taking notes in the outline, I want you to underline the words in verse 1, elect, and in verse 2, the word foreknowledge. Those are the key words that we will be beginning to focus on now. So he calls them the elect exiles, and then in verse 2, he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So he begins this letter by reminding the believers of who they are in light of God's sovereign hand upon their lives. That in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the persecution, we must remember one thing for certain. And that is you are sovereignly selected by God before the foundation of the world. You are not an accident. You are not a mistake. 
You are not here by some happen by some chance. God has sovereignly selected you not only to be here in this period in human history, but God has selected you. For all of you who have placed your faith in Christ, that is proof that God has thought of you and desired to save you from before you were even born. He calls them the elect exiles, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And so throughout this series, I want you to pray that you would understand the weight of this truth a little bit more. That those who trust in Christ were chosen by God. That before we did anything, God decided to have you in his family forever. This truth exalts God and his saving grace as the pinnacle of his providence. That you are because of God. And you are saved because of God. You see, this understanding of election will humble the sinner and exalt God. It humbles the sinner because it makes clear that it is nothing that we have done to receive this honor. It is all because of God. You see, when we compliment a baby for being dressed in a cute way, it is not saying, we are not saying to the baby, man, this baby knows how to dress. It is usually complimenting the mother, right? Because if the father dressed them, you wouldn't be complimenting how the baby's dressed, right? Uh, so it's usually complimenting the mother uh, because the mom did it all. The baby did nothing to pick and select the clothes, right? Uh, and in a similar way, election is all God's work and doing. It exalts God and humbles the elect. For the world says you need to earn it to deserve it. But in the doctrine of election, you are a trophy of God's grace. You are saved by God's grace, not by our works. You see, true faith sees all of life through a filter. What is that filter? The filter of God's sovereign hand, the hand of the Father in heaven who is orchestrating all things in our lives, who guides all things to their ultimate purpose, and that is to bring glory to the name of Jesus. Everything is under the sovereign hand of God. There is great mystery and there is great majesty in the sovereignty of God. One way to understand this mystery is to picture yourself before several doors. And above each door is the word choose. And so you choose a certain door and you walk through that door. And when you close that door and look back, the word above that door is chosen. And that is part of the mystery of how it works. That yes, it is our choice and doing to choose Christ and to trust in him. But also through that door of faith that we walk through, as we walk through it in faith, we realize that our choice was also part of God's choosing of our lives as well. So Peter reminds us that they are elect, that they are chosen and saved by the foreknowledge of God. And as God's people, as royalty of God, does that mean that we should expect to be the wealthy of the world, the respected of the world, the famous people of the world? You would think that being royalty of God means a lot of great benefits await us in this world. But Peter doesn't stress that. In fact, he says this. Instead, he goes on to say that not only are you sovereignly selected, also you need to remember that we are strangers in this world. So everyone repeat, we are strangers in this world. Okay, look at 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 again. So Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles, and you can underline that word now. So we are elect exiles of the dispersion. Right? So the NIV translation actually translates exiles as strangers in the world. Now that's a very surprising thing to be called considering that we are the people of God, isn't it? God's elect are not the famous of the world. They are not the most respected of the world. He says, no, you need to remember that we are strangers in this world. Why? Because we are pilgrims on a journey home. That this world in its current form is not our home. We are not home yet. 
You know, it's pretty strange uh, for me, having lived outside of the United States for over 19 years now, almost 20 years, and I definitely feel like a stranger whenever I go back home, unless I'm in the Dallas Cowboys store, then I feel right at home. But except for that place, whenever I go back to the U.S., I, I definitely feel different now, that this is a different place, different culture, and I feel like a foreigner whenever I'm there. And just to give you a frame of reference, as to how long it's been that, since I've lived in the U.S. and how old I am, uh, I left the U.S. right before reality TV went mainstream with, with uh, Survivor. That's how old I am, okay? Um, some of you, you weren't even born yet, right? Your whole life knows reality TV, right? Uh, but for me, spending three years in Canada, in Vancouver, almost seven years in Australia, and my two stints in Korea so far, about nine and a half years in Korea, um, I realized that there's no one country that I really feel at home in anymore. And so part of me can be, feel at home anywhere because there's no one place that's really my home. But another part of me can't feel at home anywhere. And so it's hard answering people when they ask, so where's home for you? Because no, it's no longer Chicago. I went to Chicago recently, first time in years, uh, not too long ago, and I felt so out of place. It felt so different. The culture, the language, the people, although the food improved, um, but everything else was pretty different. You know? uh, and I realized that that is actually a good feeling to have as people of faith. Why? Because more than feeling that a per particular city or a country is home for you. As a people of faith, we need to remember that our primary citizenship is not of the U.S. or Canada, Australia, or Korea. Our primary citizenship as people of God are citizens of heaven. That is where we ultimately belong. That is home for us. Amen? Heaven is home. So don't feel too surprised when life on earth feels hard and strange. In fact, I truly believe one of the purposes of pain in this world is to keep us detached from wanting to cling on to this world too tightly. I really believe that is the one of the divine, mysterious purposes of pain that enters our lives so that we don't get too comfortable here to keep our hearts restless and longing for our ultimate rest in the presence of Jesus. And that's part of the reason why Peter is writing this letter, that the church is persecuted, the church is suffering, and he is reminding them to encourage them where to keep their eyes, who they really are, what citizenship they really belong to, and where they really need to call home. And it is not on this earth in its current form. He's saying you're going through trials, but remember, it's temporary. You're going through suffering, but remember, that too will not last. So more and more, do you feel a disconnect following Jesus in this world and in this world's value system that hates Jesus? Do you feel the tension? Do you feel the disconnect? It is a reminder that you are strangers in this world, in a world that does not honor God. And especially with the persecution happening to Christians around the world, yes, in North Korea, yes, in Iraq, but a growing sentiment of hatred of Christ and his word even in the Western world, we need to remember now more than ever the words of Jesus found in John 15, verses 18 to 20. I provided it for you in your outline. Can we read that together? John 15, 18, 20. Ready, begin? If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Such relevant prophetic words for our generation. Jesus is reminding us, hey, remember this. If the world hates you because you love me, keep in mind it hated me first. And it is because I chose you out of the world. Once again, 
an echo of the sovereign selection of God's providence within our lives. These words ring true for our brothers and sisters in the Middle East and other parts of the world. But these are words that we in the English-speaking Western world need to become more aware of. Because as the return of Christ draws closer, the room at which you can be a casual, lukewarm Christian will get smaller and smaller. There will be less and less room for casual Christianity as the end draws near. Because you're going to need to pick your truth of what you're going to stand upon. You see, the world is growing in its hatred for the truth of the gospel. It hates the biblical definition of marriage. The world hates the truth that Jesus is the only way to salvation and life. The world hates honoring the child in the womb as life to be protected. The world hates not only truth, but all who love the truth, as the Bible declares. So do you feel this tension? Do you realize that this is not our home? So do not forget the words of Jesus, as things will get more difficult for the believer in the years to come. Remember the words of Jesus in John. Remember what I've said to you, he says. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Persecution is coming in ways that we have never known before. So be ready. And be ready by falling in love with Jesus. Only a love for Jesus will keep our hearts from loving this world. And the reverse is also true. The more we love this world, the less our love will grow for Jesus. Because as Jesus also teaches us in his Gospels, we cannot serve, we cannot follow, we cannot love two masters within our lives. You will hate one and love the other or despise one and be devoted to the other. And so it's time to choose who is your master, who is your Lord. And it is time to choose Jesus. Amen? Because this world is not our home. And Peter also reminds us of one other thing. Not only are we sovereignly selected by his hand, not only are we strangers in this world to remind us that you should feel different from this world. You should feel friction in this world at times. You should realize that something's not right in this world because this is not your home. We are strangers in this place. And Peter also reminds us that we are sanctified by the Spirit. So everyone repeat, we are sanctified by the Spirit. And we'll unpack what that means in a moment. But look at 1 Peter 1, 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit. So if you want to keep taking notes, underline those words. Sanctification of the Spirit. So another reminder that Peter gives is that we are chosen by God in order to be sanctified by the Spirit. Now what does that mean? Sanctification is simply God changing us to become more like Christ through the power of the Spirit. You see, we are not done with sin completely in this fallen world. We still get tempted. We still wrestle with sin and temptation. But it is a process where we hate sin a little bit more and we love Jesus a little bit more each day. And we are being changed in our character to reflect the beauty of Christ a little bit more. C.S. Lewis once said, every time you make a choice, you are turning the control part of you, the part that chooses, into something a little bit different than it was before. You are taking your life as a whole with all your innumerable choices. You are slowly turning this control thing even, either into a heavenly creature or a hellish one. And so what he is saying is that our lives are made up of all the choices that we have made. All those individual small choices that we make each day, it shapes us and forms us ultimately to who we are today. So those choices have power to make us. And it is by his spirit and by his grace, we are able to make choices that honor Christ 
and helps us become like him as well. And this is part of the encouragement that Peter offers to us as well. That in this fallen world, we may often feel alone. And that is not how it was meant to be. In this world that hates the Jesus that we love, we still struggle with sin. We still fall. We still give in to temptation. But he is saying, but know this. Because you have been selected by God, not by your goodness, not by your deeds, but by God's sovereignty, and that he has chosen you to be different from this world, it is God's grace that will also work in your life to make you more like Christ. Because though you fail and though you fall, Christ will never give up on you. Christ will will never give up on his people. Amen? So you will struggle. But you see, God did not choose you because you don't struggle. God did not choose you because you are perfect. In your fallenness, in your frailty, in your sin, God chose you, saved you, elected you. Therefore, no, God is at work in you. And he will never let you go. He will not give up on you. He is committed to finishing the good work that he has started in you by his grace. Amen? And so no, though you struggle and fail and you will continue to struggle and fail in this journey home, God will never give up on you. He is committed to forming Christ in you. Amen? And that is the encouragement that we could have, that we are saved by grace, we are chosen by grace, and we are being sanctified by his grace too. He is changing our desires to hate sin a little bit more, to love Jesus a little bit more. He is changing us to trust him a little bit more, to treasure him a little bit more than we have before. And this process will be lifelong. And it will be painful at times. But we will come out more pure in the end. More like Jesus, more in love with Jesus. And that will be worth it in the end. John Newton, uh, he wrote Amazing Grace, the hymn that we are all familiar with and we sing today. Uh, he also was a former slave trader and very influential in the life of William Wilberforce. Uh, when uh, Wilberforce uh, became a believer and he was contemplating leaving politics and becoming a pastor, uh, he sought the counsel of John Newton. And it was John Newton who told him to not go into pastoral ministry, but to see his political arena of work as his mission field. And so that was an influential and key uh, counsel that Newton gave to Wilberforce, which obviously transformed uh, so much of the abolitionist movement of that generation. And a few years before John Newton died, his eyes were getting very weak. And so uh, he would invite a fellow brother in the Lord over from church to read scripture to him. And uh, after, they would re he, he, after he would hear the scripture, he would usually share some thoughts, and then they would pray together. And this one time, when this brother came over, he read the words, by the grace of God, I am what I am. But then suddenly Newton became very silent. And for several minutes, he didn't say anything. So finally, when he did open his mouth, he said this, I am not what I ought to be. How imperfect and deficient I still am. I am not what I wish I could be. Although I abhor that which is evil and would cleave to that which is good. I am not what I hope to be, but soon I shall be out of mortality and with, with it all sin and imperfection. But then he said this, though I am not what I ought to be, I, nor am I what I wish to be, nor yet what I hope to be, I can truly say I am not what I once was, a slave to sin and to Satan. And we join in heartily agreements to Newton's reflection and observation about God's gift of sanctifying work within our lives. That we are not who we ought to be. We are still fallen. 
We are not who we wish we could be. We wish we could be so much more like Jesus. We are not what we hope to be. We hope so much to have more maturity and purity in our life and our walk. We are not all these things. But by God's grace, we are also not who we used to be. Amen. We are not people who no longer care about God. We are not people who have no conscience towards sin and its consequences. We are not who we once were, people enslaved to sin and this world. And that is grace and sanctification, that he is changing us. He is changing our desires. He is changing our thought life. He is changing us to be more like Jesus than we were before. Amen. That is grace. And Peter is reminding them of this. Because when you're suffering, you are prone to give in to temptation more, aren't you? Because you want to comfort yourself. When you are persecuted, sometimes you will compromise because you're like, man, nobody understands. I feel so alone. And so we give in. And Peter is reminding them, hey, you will fail, you will fall, but you are changing because God is committed to transforming your heart and your life. You are chosen. You are not abandoned. You are not a mistake. God is at work. And you must remember who and whose you really are. And then Peter mentions one more thing to the churches, and that is a reminder that we are saved to serve. So everyone repeat, we are saved to serve. Look at 1 Peter 1, 2 again. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, and if you're taking notes, underline this next phrase, for obedience to Jesus Christ. That is another reason why we are saved. We are saved for obedience to Jesus Christ. So we are saved to serve and to obey Christ. But part of the sanctification process changes our hearts so that obeying Jesus is not just duty and drudgery, but it becomes delight to do as well. Peter's foresight once said, the first duty of every soul is to find not its freedom, but its master. Every person is a slave to something or someone. You see, we are ultimately slaves to the one whom we obey. Who do you obey always? Your flesh, your desires, your girlfriend? The one that you always obey is the one to whom your soul has submitted in surrender towards. You see, even a rebellious spirit to our parents when we were young is one way of saying, I am not under your authority. I don't want to listen to you. I don't have to listen to you. And what we are doing is we are taking ourselves out of their authority. Because I don't have to listen to you. I'm not under you. Okay? And when we disobey Christ, we are in essence saying the same thing. I will not have my life under your word or under your authority. But there is a danger in this. When we take ourselves out of the authority of Christ, we are not under the authority of our own lives. There is only one other place that we fall under. If we are not under the authority of Christ, then we are under the authority of Satan. Because he is the God of this world. And so it is not a small thing to reject Jesus. It is not a small thing to be in rebellion against Jesus. Because what you are doing is you are lining up your allegiance under the authority of the enemy. And so that is why it is crucial for us when we do rebel, when we do fail, to repent and turn back and bow under the authority of Jesus again. Amen? That is crucial. You see, that is one of the many paradoxes of the Christian faith. The Christian faith has a lot of paradoxes. That to truly live, you must die. Right? That true strength comes in weakness. And one more paradox of the Christian faith is that only in submission to Jesus do we find freedom for the soul. 
Only when we become slaves to our Savior are we truly set free forever. And that freedom is revealed in a heart that delights in serving our Savior. John Piper says it well. He says, God's commands are only as hard to obey as his promises are hard to believe. So he's saying that to obey Jesus is really to say, God, I trust you. I trust your word. I trust your ways. I trust your promises that with obedience comes blessings. I trust that your ways are the best ways to live. I'm saying, God, I trust you. For it is a sign of faith when we obey and serve Jesus. A heart that is sanctified finds great honor in serving Jesus. It changes our attitude from have to to get to. That's a big change. You see, yesterday, as I mentioned earlier, was the three-year memorial for Pastor Ha's death. And to this day, I still count it one of the highest honors that I was able to serve him for the final years and days of his life. You see, because when we love someone, when we honor them, when we respect someone, it is a joy and a privilege to serve them. And the sanctified hearts finds great honor in serving Jesus. Amen. It is an honor to serve him. It changes the heart attitude from have to to get to. That I get to serve him for all my days. That is the new identity and the new creation that we become in Christ. It is both scary and strange when you forget who you really are. There was a real-life memento type of person who lost his short-term memory ability. Uh, he had to write down everything because he would forget literally after he does something or says something whether he did or not. So he would have to write down and his family would have to write down for him that he just ate, that he went to the bathroom, that he uh, did this and all these other things. He brushed his teeth. He couldn't remember past the age of 17, even though he was 44 years old. And so he couldn't understand it that his brother was looking so old. And he couldn't recognize himself when he would look in the mirror because he would still remember himself as a 17-year-old, not as a 44-year-old man. And so there was so much confusion and pain because he could not fully understand who he really was. And it is both scary and strange when we lose our proper identity of who we really are and where we've come from and where we are going. And sadly, as I've been in ministry for many years now, there is also a similar identity crisis that so many believers face. They wonder and they think, I'm part of this world, and they want to gain acceptance from the world. They want the applause of the world. They want the respect of the world when they are forgetting that they are not of this world. And for many who are third culture kids as well, those with multiple cultural upbringings, are you Canadian? Are you American? Are you Korean? But all of these identity and security issues get resolved when you remember the core of who you are, and that is a citizen of God's kingdom. That our true identity, our true security is found in Christ. Amen? That you are Christian, child of God, chosen, selected, saved. There's a tattoo parlor in Hong Kong where you can get anything written on your body, any design, any phrases. But out of the many phrases and images that were on the walls to select from, one stood out and that said, born to lose. Now, how many people would really want to pay for that, right? Yeah, I'd like to get born to lose and show everybody that, right? And the owner was asked, do people really buy this one? And he said, sometimes they do, actually. And he was asked, why? Why would anybody buy this? And then he said, before tattoo on body, tattoo on mind. So before the world puts labels on you, you need to remember 
that God has already marked you as his. That you are mine. I have chosen you. I have adopted you because I love you. That you belong to him. Amen. So never forget who you are. Let's pray. Thank you.